Friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I want to welcome you to this special online-only service of worship for Riverside United Church for January 24th, 2021. My name is Dave Exley. I'm the lead minister for Riverside. And in this service today, though we cannot be together, though we continue in this lockdown here in the province of Ontario, we still have a sense that God is there with us, greeting us today through the gift of all creation, through the light that we see this day, through the sounds of nature that we hear this day, as we look outside and see the snow perhaps, or see the, the birds, we're reminded that God is present with us in creation. There is hope for tomorrow. There is light that will guide us into tomorrow. And so as you listen to the words of these hymns that we share and the words that we hear from scripture and from other places, I hope that they will inspire you today and bring you hope in the days to come. Let us open our worship service in song. Worship God's holy name. 
the Lord's word came to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and declare against it the proclamation that I am commanding you. And Jonah got up and went to Nineveh, according to the Lord's word. Now Nineveh was indeed an enormous city, a three days walk across. Jonah started into the city walking one day, and he cried out, Just forty days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on mourning clothes, from the greatest of them to the least significant. God saw what they were doing, that they had ceased their evil behavior. So God stopped planning to destroy them, and he didn't do it. Well, we continue our sermon series today, Created Anew, celebrating God's creativity and our own in the season of new beginnings. In today's message, our third installment in the series, we will explore the theme, Creativity in Connection, as we examine this familiar story we just heard from the book of Jonah. And so with that, let us open in prayer. Let us pray. O creative God, source of all beauty, you give light to the soul. Open our hearts as we listen for your word. Open our minds as we dream with you. Reveal your life-giving truth that comforts and disturbs us through Jesus the Christ. Amen. When it comes to the Christian faith, there is a great deal of reductionism that takes place among insiders and outsiders alike. We reduce our faith tradition to a simple phrase found in the pages of scripture or, or a line from one of our favorite hymns. Many followers of Jesus, often without knowing it, have reduced the tradition uh, he founded to simple lists, rules like the Ten Commandments. Some might suggest that following Jesus and honoring God is as simple as setting that list of ten things above everything else in our lives, even though we may remember only three of those ten things on that so-called all-important list that we raise above all other things. But when we reduce our faith tradition to a few simple words or, or phrases that we've selected, or perhaps have been selected for us, from an immense library of books, that document the long and continuing story of our rich and complex faith tradition, we miss so much. For the Bible is not just a book filled with lists and commandments. It is a book, as we see from our reading this morning, that is filled with other things. Things like songs and stories of God's prophets, those messengers that engage in the work of God as they connect with their neighbors and strangers, those both near and far. And so, if God sends us prophets, it must mean that, that lists aren't God's sole way of acting in the world and speaking to the world. There must be more to following the ways of Jesus than just examining a few passages from the pages of Scripture. And so with that, let us turn to this reading that we just heard. For some of you, it might feel like we talked about the story of Noah just recently, and in some ways we did talk about it basically yesterday. One of the lectionary texts from last fall was taken from this short book from the Hebrew Bible from the Old Testament. And once again, we hear this story. It's a story that we know. We know that God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh, to practice, to preach to the people, to tell them to stop turning away from God. We know in the story that he resists, that he instead hops on a boat and heads in the other direction, essentially hiding from God and putting off the work that God wants him to do. A storm then kicks up, so the story tells us, and Jonah is convinced that, that God is causing harm to come his way. And so he tells the people on the boat, the others, to throw him overboard. And then in the story, we get that, that story about the great fish that comes and swallows Jonah, and he finds himself holding on for dear life until the fish finally coughs him up on a distant shore. This becomes the tipping point for him, for Jonah. No point in delaying any longer. And so 
So the story goes, he goes to Nineveh. He shares what God wants him to share. And thankfully, thankfully the people receive his message. They turn from their ungodly ways and all is made well in the world. If there's one thing many of us share in common with Jonah, it is our reluctance to listen. This is a major theme in this story from Scripture. Like Jonah, we often end up silencing God, filling up the spaces of our lives before God has had a chance to speak words of transformation to us. We would soon rather not be created anew. Professor and biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann, when speaking about the words of of Scripture, suggests that the writers of Scripture had listened a lot. It's a great theme that emerges from the pages of Scripture. In an interview that Brueggemann gave a few years ago, he had this reflection to share on the words of Scripture. He said, The artists who speak in the pages of Scripture, particularly for him in places like the Psalms, Their words amount to a critique of institutions that do not listen. They keep opening the possibility of being more attentive to the pain of the world. He suggests that the church has been uh, by and large silenced by, or has by and large silenced the lament songs of our tradition. And the byproduct of that is that it has, in Brueggemann's mind, and I would agree with him on this, it has allowed the church to escape the bodily reality connected to all that lament and pain. We ignore it. We escape it. Well, this past week we had a chance to listen to the voice of someone who shared some prophetic words with us and showed us what it means to truly listen to the hurting world around us. Did you happen to catch this rising star from the presidential inauguration uh, that took place in the U.S., in the U.S. Capitol on Wednesday? (laughs) No, not that one. Uh, Thanks, Bernie. Uh, No, I I meant Amanda Gorman, that amazing 22-year-old American poet who shared her poem entitled The Hill We Climb with the crowd on Wednesday morning. Listen to these amazing words that Amanda Gordon wrote. Uh, Words that she wrote after watching the horrifying scene at the U.S. Capitol just two weeks prior to when she shared this poem at Wednesday's inauguration. In the poem, she offers words of hope for all of us, and she demonstrates what it means to do that prophetic listening that God calls us to do. Here are just a few lines from that poem. She writes this. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise to glade the hill we climb, if only we dare. We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be. And one thing is certain, she goes on to say, if we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. Every breath from my bronze-pounded chest, we will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold-limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the wind-swept northeast, where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake-rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun-baked south. We will rebuild reconcile and recover in every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country. Our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough 
to be it. Here is a young woman that is in tune with the voice of God speaking in our world. Here is a young woman who knows how to listen, to listen to the songs of lament that call us to both acknowledge our pain, but to also find a way to rise up from it. In many ways, Gorman is that modern-day prophet that invites us to do the difficult work of co-creating with God. Going back to Walter Brueggemann, the professor and writer from our Christian tradition, in an interview, that same interview I was speaking about, he gave a few years ago, he talked about art and the role of the artist. I think there's a good connection to be made between what he said in that interview and what we just heard from the voice of Amanda Gordon. For Brueggemann said, art is the articulation of a world other than the one we take for granted. Because if I only live in the world I take for granted, I don't have to think. I don't have to decide anything. I don't have to run any risks. I don't have to have any hopes. What art does, Brueggemann says, is to expose our taken-for-granted world as something less than real and normative. Which is why, he says, totalitarian regimes are always afraid of artists. It seems like these past four years, we've, we've not heard the voice of artists like we have in the past. Perhaps we've been too busy listening to the all-caps tweets coming from on high. I'm so ready for the words of the prophets, the words of the artists, to begin to once again rise above all the other more destructive noises and voices in this world and guide us to that place that God so longs for us to go. But as this passage from Jonah reminds us, we cannot go it alone. We must go together. When Jonah shares God's words with the people of Nineveh, what do they do? The text says this. It says, They proclaimed a fast and put on mourning clothes from the greatest of them to the least significant. The words of God penetrated the hearts of those who were on top, and it trickled down to the least significant within the city. God's call to lament and turn in a new direction was heard by all. In fact, isn't it interesting that the people of Nineveh were quicker to listen to God than Jonah was? They are the ones who, upon hearing God's sadness over their wicked ways, immediately changed their ways. They immediately recognize what they need to do. God's word is, as it always is and will be, strong enough to prompt creation to change its ways. The first step for us in this listening, this step of listening, this step of empathy and understanding, those things that we're called to embody with our living, is listening. That's the first step. In order to eradicate all the shame and pain in the world, we must be willing to press pause on that inner voice that is consistently wanting to interrupt the story of both ourselves and of others. The first step for any artist is to do the same, to listen, to press pause on all those thoughts that cast a shadow over our thinking. Well, this takes bravery. It takes courage for us to stop and listen. I can remember during my, my time of studying theology in seminary a number of years ago uh, that we had to, in one class, do something that was very difficult. But it has me thinking about this as we talk about listening today. We were asked in this class to, to sit in front of another person, a person we did not know, and just stare at them for 10 straight minutes without talking to just be attentive to the other person before us. We sat knee to knee with this other person, almost touching very close to that other person, and it was an awkward period of silence for 10 straight minutes. It was incredibly challenging. In fact, more challenging than you would think. But what it, what it did for me 
And I think what it did for all of us in that class and for other people who have taken that class was that it taught us, certainly taught me, how to empty myself in order to make space for the other. So often when we look upon others, we come with preconceived notions of who they are. Our inner thoughts tell us who the other person is without giving them the space to fill the void. We pre-fill that space with things like, you're young or you're old, you're organized or you're too uptight, you have something to offer me or you have nothing to offer me. God invites us to silence these voices, to listen so that we might be open to the divine voice that precedes our voice and may say something completely different and in fact often does. That voice that if we're listening may say, you are one with me or you are a possibility. So often when we stop to listen, those are the things that we end up hearing. Words of blessing that interrupt judgment. Words of love that interrupt words of shame. Words of creation that interrupt this world that so longs to tear things down. Every day we're faced with the challenge of moving from unwilling messengers to willing messengers for God. Each and every day we face a world that God tells us is blessed and worthy of love, worthy of saving. The question is, will we say yes to God's pronouncement on the world? Will we say yes to the world that God has already said yes to? Or will we continue to move toward those shadows as we've done in the past? And so, as we ponder those questions, let's hear the voice of God today. When God says, says to us, each and every one of us, when day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new day blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. In the days ahead, may we be brave enough to see it, brave enough to be it. Amen. And let us pray. Almighty and compassionate God, we know that you care for all people, whether they are here, around us, or in far-off places. You care enough to call people to bring the good news to them. You care about our world, O oh God, and for that we give thanks. Most especially you are there, lifting us up in the midst of this time of pandemic, taking care of those who need it being with us and guiding us through this challenging time. You care about all the countries of the world, for those places that are in the midst of conflict, for those that have deep economic problems. And God, we lift all those places up to you in addition to our own land. Oh God, we know that you care about those who are sick, those who are in pain, those in hospital, homebound and in nursing homes. Your compassion extends to all of them, and for that we give you thanks. You care, O oh God, about those who carry heavy burdens, those with broken hearts, those who are grieving, those who are lonely, those who are anxious. Be with all your people this day and in the days ahead. And God, we know that you care about a great number of people losing their jobs, those losing their homes, losing their bank accounts, as well as those who have had none of those for a long time. God, you care for those who answered your call to preach your word, teach your word, pastor your flock, and lead in songs of praise. Your compassion extends to them as well. And so, Lord, this day we take time just to give thanks for your great compassion your care, your mercy, and the good news that you bring to us this day and in all our days through the one who was the light for this world. And it's in his name that we pray all these things. Amen.
Friends, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of God's Spirit. Go in peace. Be blessed. Amen.